um, it was in many ways a circuitous path, in many ways not. I, um, I began life for my scholarly life as someone, an 18 year old, interested in things like biology, evolutionary biology in particular, physics. I thought I would make my life there. And so. But there was always a tug, I felt, about matters of public policy. Why are people poor? Why are countries poor? I actually come from a very poor country. Why is this country so poor? Do people here seem, seem wonderful? It was my sense that answers to those questions lay within the purview of economics. And so, on a, suggest a friend's suggestion, I stumbled into an economics course. And I remember sitting in the class as this guy talked about scarcity and equilibrium and so on, and thinking, I never want to do anything else. Um, and so, do you see what I mean about it being both circuitous and immediate? I stumbled in and never left, and I've loved every moment of it. So it is, in many ways, I'm not sure that a deficit is about questions as much as it exists about convincing definitive answers. So for example, the very questions that moved me, it's becoming longer and longer ago now as I look backwards, are the same questions that animate the first year PhD student in economics or in public policy. The questions haven't changed. Why are countries poor? Why are there pockets of poverty? Um, why is there inequality, etc.? Who determines the dispersal of the public resources? What has changed is that um, over time our answers to a growing share of those questions has become ever sharper for two reasons. One is the, um, the advent of relatively sophisticated techniques empirically. And so that many of the questions I just listed interested people like Mill and Ricardo and Malthus and Marshall. And, but it was hard to answer them, given the techniques then available. Now we know about experimental methods. We have developed structural modeling that allows us to link the causal relationship between variables, understand the behavior of systems much better than was historically the case. The second change has been the advent of large data sets. Um, and so it would have been impossible to think or measure convincingly the nature of intergenerational earnings linkages, those data not having been present, not those were not being present in the old days. Today, one can imagine a second year graduate student getting traction on that question. M more broadly, people have studied questions we like. Um, tax policy and, its and the effect on behavior. And they've only been able to do that because massive data sets involving tens of millions of people have over the last several years become available. When the growth of that data availability, availability is combined with the rise in processing power and computing skill, we can answer questions better. Now, one thing about answering questions convincingly is that whereas in the old days we could say, well, I'm not, I don't know for sure, so let me just ask another question. Now we know something for sure, a small but growing set of things, and that knowledge itself spawns new questions. And so I'm not ducking the question. What I'm instead saying that for me, it is on the empirical side that economics is making the most inroads, A, and that B, most of the most important inroads and insights will involve empirical methods attached to old questions. Uh, questions about moral hazard, or adverse selection, or equilibrium, yes? That are questions that have bedeviled economists for 150 years. We're going to be able to answer them. That's how I would think about it. Inequality research and research more broadly, I would say, um, so one can't be a practicing economist without having some measure of um, formal quantitative sophistication in two realms. One is the computing realm or earlier mentioned. You have to be comfortable around data. You have to be comfortable thinking about how one isolates evidence for causal relationships in the messy data that comes, comes to hand. 
But another kind of technical sophistication is what might be termed theoretical reasoning, by which I mean the capacity to be precise in one's thinking and in one's speaking, <laughs> so that one knows what is testing, what one is testing, what relationship exactly is it you're after, what mechanism precisely are you hypothesizing, etc. You might believe that that is something that can be picked up late in life. In my view, it can't. It has to be nurtured early on. And um, even 18, that'd be too late. But 18 is a good place to start. So that's one kind of skill, technical in two ways. Another kind of skill that must be nurtured, in my view, is um, uh, a certain breadth of erudition, which is to say that one must the successful economist, 50 years hence, will be ride, widely read in fields outside of economics. Now, if one looks at the most interesting work being done in economics now, lots of it involves um, the intersection of, the abutting of, economics in another field. Two examples come to mind. One is economics and history. So we're asking interesting, relatively old economic history questions using modern methods to attack data that were put together or created, if you will, a hundred years ago. People are thinking about, uh, thinking about property rights, measuring the advent of barbed wire. What was the nature of institutions on the determination of current outcomes, etc. These are historical questions that the modern economists tackle. Similarly, in the field of behavioral economics, that's all about the intersection of economics with a branch of psychology. It is my conjecture that over time, areas like this will be more and more fertile. So the economist will be someone skilled, and can take derivatives and all that, and think run regressions, but will know stuff about other things, will be institutionally rich. She will have widely read. She'll be very curious. Um, and she will incorporate insights from other fields, not in a dim dismissive way. She'll say, sociologists have much to teach us. So do psychologists, so do whatever. And I'll think about ways of blending my insights with theirs. Those would be my two key recommendations.